I want to shift gears now to some endoscopic procedures, really the endoscopic third ventriculosity and its role in pediatric hydrocephalus. So this is a is a really a a, a great way um, to deal with with non-communicating hydrocephalus. And as we see, as we'll see, the indications are beginning to expand more into some of the communicating types of hydrocephalus. But essentially, the procedure itself creates a new pathway between the ventricular compartment and the subarachnoid space. And you can see here, typically, uh, the CSF is generated in the lateral and third ventricle, and even in the fourth ventricle, but the majority is up above in the lateral and third ventricles. And it flows down through the cerebral aqueduct and eventually exits into the subarachnoid spaces through the, the fromina of uh, Majandi and, and Lushka in the posterior fossa. And you can see the CSF is in the subarachnoid space making its way up towards the vertex where it'll eventually be reabsorbed. The key here is that in somebody who has a blockage either at the, at the level of the uh, midbrain, posterior third ventricle, fourth ventricle, or the fourth ventricular outflow foramina, the CSF can't get out into the subarachnoid space. So the CSF, this is a very simple concept, um, is allowed to escape through a, an opening through the floor of the third ventricle. So a third, ventricul third ventricle ostomy, third ventricular ostomy. So we make a small fenestration or ostomy in the, in the bottom of the, in the floor of the third ventricle. Really, success of that procedure depends upon the appropriate uh, pa doing it on the right patient. So there's certain categories we know that there's a very high likelihood of success. So children with problems in the in the third ventricle, specifically the posterior third ventricle. So if they have a pineal region tumor, like this child here with with an immature teratoma, very high success rate for ETV in that situation. If there's an issue with the aqueduct, whether it's a congenital aqueductal stenosis, or if there's a tectal tumor, as in this child here on the bottom left, you can see here, um, again, another very good um, case where there's a very high likelihood of uh, success if the surgeon is able to accomplish a third ventriculostomy. And then there's some fourth ventricle problems. So here's a severe Chiari malformation where the fourth ventricular outflow foramina are just obstructed because of a lack of space. Um, it can also be seen in QRE2 malformations, um, posterior fossa tumors, even after resection, say a child with a medial blastoma develops hydrocephalus, they, they can typically be a good candidate. Many of those kids for a third ventriculostomy after the fact or after the tumor's removed. And, and, and a rare, but uh, another possible case is a child with a cerebellar infarction with a lot of cerebellar edema and um, hydrocephalus because of that. And one other thing is that we know that the success of these procedures is generally better in children over six months of age, probably because of the, uh, the subarachnoid spaces just aren't as well developed in, in those younger, younger kids. So there's a lot of anatomical considerations that one needs to pay attention to. Um, so both of the ventricles themselves and the surrounding structures. And here's a 10-year-old here's a girl who had, a, as we'll see in a few minutes, a large thalamic tumor that was causing obstruction of the aqueduct. So important things that we need to look at before, before considering surgery is, you know, where is the basilar artery and is there really enough space for us to safely perform a third ventriculostomy? Here's the target right here. This is the tuber scenarium here. So we wanna make sure that there's enough space here to safely um, pass our stylet or whatever device we're gonna to use to make the fenestration without endangering the, the basilar artery. So that's an important thing to, to look at. So we, if it's very close or if it's up against or in contact with the, with the dorsum or, or with the clivus, then that may be a relative contraindication. In kids that have uh, QRI2 malformation and spina bifida, if they have a very large mass of intermediate, which they oftentimes do, almost all of them do, but if it's very large, that may actually obstruct the ability to see the floor of the third ventricle. And then sometimes there can be tumors that, um, um, there may be like a child with a, a germ cell tumor in the posterior third ventricle where there's some um, a secondary lesion near the floor of the third ventricle. And it's just, even if you could do the third uh, ventriculostomy, the tumor could potentially grow back and eventually obstruct the, uh, the orifice of the third ventricle, uh, third ventriculostomy. So things like that need to be considered. And another thing that's important in terms of anatomy and <clears throat> planning is the trajectory. Um, and we'll see why this is an important point here because um, I think the me one, an important message is that it's not often just a standard burr hole like you would use for, a, for an external ventricular drain or even a, a right frontal ventricular peritoneal shunt because sometimes that may be too far forward and it may 
um, jeopardize the success of the, uh, of the procedure. So what I like to do on these preoperative images and oftentimes right on the, st the navigational planning station is essentially draw the trajectory and I find that where the tuber scenario is, where the, where the opening is gonna be created, where the fenestration we made, here's the framing right here, here's the fornix that you can see and just get an idea of where that burr hole should be. You can see the coronal sutures right here on this MRI, it may be difficult to see, but this is essentially how I plan this out on my uh, planning station with the navigation, just to give you an idea, because if you put the burr hole a little too far forward up here, and you, you come in with your endoscope, then number one, your trajectory is actually towards the basilar artery, and number two, then if you really wanna move the anterior to look at the, the, where the uh, anterior part of the third ventricle, then you have to put some pressure on the fornix, which can cause damage to that important structure. So just, it's an important thing. It's just not a stab in the dark. It really takes some planning to really pick out a, a proper entry point. When the surgery is performed, the, obviously the patient's in a supine position. Most surgeons prefer a right-sided approach, unless there's a reason not to say something on the right side. Um, the head's a little bit elevated. I like a, I like a horseshoe, but some people can do that on a donut. And this, I, I prefer navigation for these, even in kids that have large ventricles for reasons that I just mentioned, but also, you know, the, the pillow sheath introducer that we're placing for the endoscope is oftentimes, well, it's usually 12 French, which is a little smaller than number two pencil. And, uh, you know, you figure that's a big catheter to be placing into some young kid's brain. And it's nice to get that right the first time because there have been a few cases where I've seen where the trajectory is off and, when you put the scope in, you realize you're on the opposite side and that's a, not a good place to be. So it's an important thing. That's why I like to use navigation, even with big ventricles, um, to optimize your trajectory and, and again, just to get that right the first time. Um, so this is what I'm talking about. This is actually from a, a recent publication from Operative Neurosurgery, but this is a standard, you know, pre-coronal burr hole for an EVD or a right frontal shunt, Coker's point, but, but this may not be ideal just to kind of, in many cases it'll work, but it may not be optimal. Um, another thing is three centimeters may be a little far from the midline because again, the third ventriculostomy is a midline procedure. And if you come way lateral on your burr hole, then your, your, your stylet is directed towards the contralateral side. So you can potentially jeopardize the contralateral third nerve when you're making your fenestration. So I like to try to be a little closer to the to the midline when I do an ETV rather than like a standard pre-coronal burr hole for a shunt. So again, registration. Another important thing here is comfort. Okay, you want to have your your imaging, your navigation, your your cameras, you know, your optics all kind of right in front of you. Don't want to have to turn your head to the side while you're working. Um, it's kind of like playing a video game. You got your controller in your hand, but you're looking straight ahead at the TV. That's kind of the way I like to think of this. It's, it's you want to be looking, you want to have, you know, have a nice comfortable stance, um, have all your equipment right there ready for you. Um, and typically it's done with two surgeons, one to hold the scope. If you don't have that, then there are scope holders that will hold the device in place. But most of the time we do these with two surgeons, one to secure and hold the scope in place and steer the scope while the other one performs the instrumentation and the actual fenestration. And, I prefer a curvilinear incision. In some cases, particularly in kids with tumors, we'll place a, a reservoir, not always. Um, the linear incision puts your burr hole oftentimes directly underneath the uh, incision. So I think in my experience, it's been a little more likely to leak than with the curvilinear incision, but it's not, not a guarantee that it couldn't. Um, so before the procedure, you need to really be careful and check all of your equipment, make sure it's operational. You don't wanna put the endoscope in first and realize that something's wrong with it. So my preference is to pretty much do a dry run. Uh, we make sure all the equipment is working. Um, we make sure the images are all focused and oriented properly um, so that, that you know, there's no doubt that we're looking at things correctly. We typically have a irrigation system in place just with gravity. My preference is lactated ringers, but other balanced solutions are, are also um, acceptable. And there's some artificial CSF that's available as well. We try to mimic CSF as much as possible. And again, all the instrumentation needs to be checked and organized before the procedure. And I, that's why I generally like to do a dry run with the resident or fellow and even the nurses. We have all the equipment laid out in the order that we expect to use it, make sure it's functional. So there's no waiting for something while you have the scope inside the uh, third ventricle. Um, so the steps really are, are um, that's what we're gonna go through right now, but 
The first is to enter the lateral ventricle. You can see the size of this peel away sheath here. Um, we put the stylet for navigation right down the stylet so we can track that in real time, as you'll see. Um, once we're in the ventricle the, with that, the, the scope is then passed down and we confirm. The first thing we do is confirm that we're on the correct side, the right side. And that's done by identifying the structures on the medial side of the ventricle, the choroid plexus and the septal vein. And then you can see the structures on the lateral side, so the thalamus striate vein, and eventually the choroid plexus, which will take you right to the frame. But usually, with, with the technique I described, you're coming right down on the frame of Monroe. It's very direct and very straight. Um, again, care should be taken if you're too far forward, that, that anterior wall of the, of the, of the, of the frame is uh, formed by the column of the fornix. So once we're in the ventricle, this is really an important picture and, and this is what you want to see. So we're on the, on the right side because the septal vein here is medial. Here's the choroid plexus. This is the thalamus striate vein heading posterior laterally. And you can see the foramen of Monroe partially obscured by the choroid plexus. And here's the column of the fornix here. It's, so if our burr hole is really forward and you have to put the scope in here and, and kind of um, work that a little bit, you can wind up with some trauma to the, to the fornix when you're done. And the choroid plexus then continues down into the roof of the third ventricle along with the, these two veins coalesce to form the internal uh, cerebral vein underneath in the third ventricle. So important, this is an important picture to recognize and to remember um, just for orientation um, for any type of lateral ventricle surgery, um, endoscopic surgery, even open surgery. So once we're finished with the uh, lateral ventricle, we're just making sure we, and we enter the third ventricle, we just go right down to the floor and inspect the floor and we need to identify the mammillary bodies. They usually jump right out. You can see them very nicely. Here's the optic chiasm more anteriorly. The super optic recess is cut off here on this image, but you can see this pink structure here. That's the infundibular recess. It's pink because that's where the portal venous blood is kind of running down towards the pituitary gland from the hypothalamus. So it has that kind of engorged kind of pink um, uh, appearance to it. This is the target point, the tuber scenarium right here. So in the midline, here's the tuber scenarium. You can see the thin floor, the third ventricle is thin enough that you can actually see the basilar apex here and probably the communicating say the PCOM coming in to, to join right here. But here's the basilar apex right here in the midline. So this is the target point. This is where we're going to create our fenestration anterior to the mammillary bodies, generally just behind the, the, the infundibular recess um, in the midline. Um, once that's completed, we uh, once, it, once it's opened, usually with a, a blunt probe um, um, or some other type of instrument, then we dilate the uh, opening with a, with a modified embolectomy balloon, and then we inspect the prepontine sister in the bottom here. And this is a, this is a grasping forcep that I like to use because it has a blunt tip. Um, it's kept closed and we put through the floor. It's not sharp. I never use power. I think most people have gotten away to using any type of applied energy to make the opening because of the the, the risk to the structures, and particularly the basilar artery in, in that, that area. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.